Okay, hello and welcome to the Beyond Center's March Ask a Physicist webinar. I have just one announcement before we get started, and that is our next Ask a Physicist will be on April 26th at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and it is BYOQ, Bring Your Own Question. All of our previous Ask a Physicist webinars are up on the Beyond Center YouTube channel, so we encourage you to view those again or for the first time if you missed them and submit any questions that you come up with via our email, deepthought at beyond.asu.edu. Beyond I'm sorry, deepthought at asu.edu. Um, or if you have any physics questions unrelated to our webinars, those are welcome as well. And the registration for that will be available in the next couple of weeks. If you have a question during tonight's webinar, please use the Q&A function within Zoom. And with that, I will turn it over to tonight's moderator, Malik Creek. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, welcome everybody to today's Ask a Physicist uh, webinar. I'm Malik Parikh, I'm a physicist at Arizona State University and today's tonight's moderator. moderator. Um, the subject of today's debate or discussion is, can computers be conscious? And we have uh, two panelists today. Um, our first speaker is Paul Davies. Um, those of you who have come here before all will recognize all of us probably, but uh, Paul Davies is the, um, uh, is, a, is a resident um, Maverick physicist here. He's the director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science, and he works in anything that catches his fancy, but he's, um, I know him for, for his uh, groundbreaking uh, work on quantum gravity, but now he works on everything from uh, cancer to astrobiology. Uh, so Paul will be our first speaker, and so I'll just hand it over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Malik, and a very warm welcome to those who are joining us. Um, and some of you are regulars, and you might be wondering, does poor Paul possess only one T-shirt? Because I'm always dressed in the same way. Uh, well, uh, no, I do have others, but this is my ASU Beyond Center T-shirt, and as the Beyond Center is hosting this event, it seems appropriate. Anyway, a landmark event in the history of science, I need to share my screen, uh, occurred. Uh, hang on. It's always a slightly inelegant start to these things because of all this uh, electronic stuff. Um, so can computers be conscious? Uh, so a landmark event in the history of science occurred in March 2016 when a computer called AlphaGo uh, beat the world Go champion Lee Sedol in a five game match. Now, uh, people who study computer games uh, regard Go as uh, the uh, toughest type of game that human beings can play. And here is a computer outsmarting uh, one of the world's most brilliant Go players. And this led to a lot of commentary, including the, uh, the age old debate about whether computers are just powerful number crunchers or in some sense sentient beings. Would AlphaGo have got uh, a strategy? Uh, would it have uh, something going on inside? Would it be thinking about what it was doing? And that really is the subject of uh, our discussion today. Now, well, for those of you born after about the 1960s, you'll have grown up on the diet of Hollywood movies featuring uh, robots and uh, androids and generally sort of sentient artificial entities, uh, computers, if you like, uh, and might find it not surprising at all, in fact, extremely plausible uh, that we could have uh, sentient or conscious uh, co computers or robots. Uh, slightly, this is, of course, from Star Wars uh, for the older generation, uh, for the younger generation, uh, ex machina, might come closer, slightly more plausible to what uh, a genuinely conscious computer might be. 
Well, I want to take you through a little bit of the history because I'm not convinced myself that anything we would now call a computer can be conscious, ever be, be conscious. Um, the subject of uh, 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 computer machines goes back uh, 200 years to the work of Charles Babbage, who originally worked on something called the difference engine to compute nautical tables. And here is a reconstruction. He was not unable to complete it in his lifetime. Uh, but here's a reconstruction of the Science Museum in London, and apparently it does work. And after designing this uh, monster called the Different Agent, he then turned his attention to something which would be, in principle, far more powerful, called the Analytical Engine. And he began building this in 1837. And the, the architecture that he had designed for the Analytical Engine uh, is that of a general purpose computing machine. It could be programmed. Uh, to, to solve any computation that is uh, solvable, in principle, it may take a very long time, particularly as this was a steam-driven device, but nevertheless had the essential idea. So it's been around for a while, but it took another hundred years for the next great leap forward. And this was uh, Alan Turing, who in 1936 published a famous paper in which the logical architecture of a universal computing machine, a programmable computer, uh, was set out. He didn't build such a thing at that time. Um, and uh, why is the Union Jack shown there? Well, because Alan Turing uh, is perhaps best known as a wartime hero. Uh, in fact, he's about to appear on a Bank of England 50 pound note. I don't think he's come out just yet uh, to commemorate his uh, extraordinary contributions to the war effort. Now, what were those contributions? Um, well, uh, this is an Enigma machine. This, these were built in Germany and they are uh, a means of encrypting and encoding messages that they were used by the German high command in, in particular to communicate with submarines out in the Atlantic. And so these were the dark days of uh, the Second World War. Uh, in 1941, uh, Britain was more or less fighting alone and uh, was supplied by convoys of ships uh, ca that came across the Atlantic from you know, Caribbean, South America, uh, United States and uh, Canada. And they, they went in convoys and the U-boats were sinking them at an enormous rate. And it really looked like Britain would simply be starved and forced to capitulate. So um, uh, in great secret, at a place called Bletchley Park, just outside London, uh, Alan Turing and others, it was quite a major operation, were recruited to try to break the Enigma code. And uh, this is an interesting piece of history. I took the trouble myself to go to Bletchley Park, and you see me here tinkering with a real Enigma machine, along with my wife and sister some years ago. Uh, anyway, this uh, is just a little bit of background history. Um, the first electronic version of a programmable computer, so this is not the steam-driven version of Babbage, was built in great secret in 1940, and it was used to crack the Enigma code, and indeed that was so successful, it's been estimated that the uh, uh, course of World War II was shortened by up to two years as a result of this code-breaking effort. Now, on the other side of the Atlantic, John von Neumann was doing something similar, not uh, for breaking codes, but built an electronic computer that's part of the Manhattan Project to model what would happen with nuclear explosions. And so this, these two efforts on either side of the Atlantic set the scene for the modern computer age. And it was only just after that in 1950 that Alan Turing wrote this famous paper, uh, Can Machines Think? Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And what he did in this uh, paper was set out an idea idea that's endured uh, for many decades, uh, the uh, so-called imitation game. And the idea is this, uh, how do I know if my computer is conscious or not, or can think, uh, or can respond like a human being? Well, supposing you put it in another building and I'm just uh, hooked up electronically, and I talk to the computer and it uh, talks back to me. Uh, if it gets to the stage where I cannot tell, uh, whether it's a computer at the other end or another human being, uh, then uh, Turing believed we should 
dignify the computer with the property of being conscious. In other words, it's consciousness by analogy. Uh, and we're faced with the same thing in daily life. Uh, I know I'm conscious, but how do I know you are conscious? You respond uh, in the appropriate way. And so therefore I'm fair by analogy, but you're conscious, but I can't be sure of that. And so the whole idea is that if a computer could mimic a human being to that level, uh, then we would ascribe consciousness to it. Uh, some of you may have seen the movie called The Imitation Game, which is, um, shows Turing's wartime work and is uh, based on this idea. It's a tragic figure in many ways, uh, but uh, let me move on. Um, I want to distinguish between uh, what is often called the easy problem and the hard problem. So the, this terminology due to David Chalmers, he's an Australian philosopher currently working uh, in uh, the United States in uh, New York. And uh, he likes to distinguish between, uh, what, uh, when I talk about the easy problem, it's not necessarily easy. Um, what, it, what the easy problem is, is uh, mapping the neural correlates of any given conscious activity. So if I look at the color red and this bit of my brain lights up, and then uh, if I hear the sound of running water and that bit of my brain lights up and so on, uh, we, we can, indeed, neuroscientists have done a fairly good job of mapping the brain activity associated with those conscious perceptions, conscious events, uh, even to the extent uh, of, uh, I think of this or I imagine that, uh, th this leads to distinct patterning. Um, and we can look forward in the future to having more or less complete map of the neural correlates. And that is what uh, Chalmers calls the easy problem. Uh, but the hard problem is the subjective sense that we all have. Uh, so I'm looking at a sign on my computer that says you are screen sharing and that's green. And next to it is stop share and that's red. And uh, to me, uh, that there's a difference. I, I can see that difference, sense that difference, feel that difference. There is a difference. Uh, it's, but it's not a difference that you can share without being me, without, as it were, uh, stepping into my body and looking out through my eyes. Uh, and so we all have this inner life, this inner sensation, these subjective impressions. Philosophers call them qualia. And uh, I'm not going to, the, the problem of qualia uh, is very profound. It's exercised uh, the best brains in philosophy for thousands of years, and it remains a problem. I'm not going to go there because that's not really what we can talk about. Given the imitation game, we cannot know whether a computer or, or another human being has the same sensation of green as I do, or the same sensation of red as I do. So that's the hard problem, we're leaving it on one side. Um, I want to now give you an argument very briefly as to uh, that has been deployed, and I think it has some force, as to why uh, a computer in the sense of a digital processing machine that uh, I'm talking to you in now cannot be conscious. And uh, this is uh, a conclusion that draws upon the work of Kurt Gödel, who in 1931 uh, published a very famous paper that seemed to undermine uh, the notion of the logical uh, structure of reality. Uh, but uh, what Gödel did was to consider contradictory self-referential statements or propositions. Uh, just to give a nutshell, this sentence is untrue. Uh, is that true? Well, if it's true, then it's not true. If it's not true, then it's true. Uh, and so once you start building uh, those sorts of statements into the foundations of logic and mathematics, uh, what you find, and what Gödel was able to publish, is that uh, mathematics is inevitably incomplete. Any given finite system of axioms, there are propositions within that system of axioms that cannot be proved uh, to be uh, uh, true or false. That is, they are undecidable propositions within that framework of axioms. And this has led to uh, some consideration in recent years, in particular uh, by two Oxford uh, uh, well, one a philosopher, one a scientist, John Lucas and Roger Penrose. Um, and uh, as many of you will know, Roger Penrose won the Nobel Physics Prize uh, just a few months ago. Uh, and uh, so uh, they uh, both uh, appealed to Gödel's incompleteness theorem uh, 
there's an argument against uh, why computers, as we normally understand them, uh, could be conscious. Uh, and the basic argument is something like this, that uh, computers run algorithms uh, based on a finite set of axioms, uh, and therefore there will be undecidable propositions within uh, that system. But we human beings can see uh, the truth of something. We can understand Gödel's theorem. A uh, the claim is a computer itself could not understand Gödel's theorem. Uh, and so that uh, forms the basis of a, an attack on the notion of computers being conscious. Uh, uh, both of these individuals suggest uh, that, um, uh, that anything like a standard computer architecture uh, that uh, uh, with based on a system of axioms would, would fail to capture the full range of what human beings experience when they are able to, uh, to look at a logical argument or look at a theorem, something like Gödel's theorem and say, aha, now I understand it. Uh, they say the computer could not do that. Um, there've been many criticisms of this argument and I'm not gonna get into it here. I don't think it's fully resolved, uh, but I want to simply make the point uh, that uh, I, I myself, uh, and skeptical that anything like a computer, as we currently know it, could be conscious. But that's not the same as saying we can't have artificial consciousness. That is to say, um, if you believe that consciousness arises from a physical process, like something going on up here, if there is such a physical process, then obviously in principle, we could mimic that process. We could build a system, it might be very expensive to build it, uh, might take a long time, but in pr principle, we could build a system that could uh, simply mimic whatever is going on. And I talked about the easy problem, mapping the neural correlates. If we had that down uh, to sufficient level of detail, we could instantiate that in a system uh, that, uh, for my money, I would call conscious. I think it would pass the imitation game. Uh, but I think it's unlikely to be anything remotely like what we call a, uh, a computer. And I just to sort of end on, on something. Uh, could it be a quantum computer? Does it have to be uh, a, a, a logical, um, uh, a Boolean logic type classical computer? Possibly. Some people, Penrose, for example, thinks that quantum mechanics is the key to consciousness. Uh, that's an idea that's been around for decades. I'm a little bit skeptical. Uh, the quantum mechanics is the answer. Um, but I just come back to the, the point I've, I've already made, which is that uh, something, something must be causing consciousness. And I suspect that ultimately it will be something sort of squishy and nebulous and full of lots of complexity. And I have no idea what I'm showing you here. It's just a Photoshop slide to indicate that this is not a computer. It's going to be some uh, complex system uh, with. Um, possibly even some new physics going on, but whatever it is, I think one day we would be able to make it. And I'm going to stop there and uh, hand you back to Malik. I've got to stop the Thank screen you. share. I think that's happened. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, our next speaker and the second panelist is Sarah Walker. Uh, Sarah is... Uh, Associate Professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. And she's the Deputy Director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. She works in, uh, she's an astrobiologist who has um, also works on the origins of life on Earth and how life emerges from physics, chemistry, and information. So um, on to you, Sarah. Thanks so much. Um, so I mostly actually probably agree with Paul on most of the points that he made, maybe not all of them. Um, so what I wanted to do was actually just sort of talk about what current the current status is of sort of leading theories of consciousness and where some of the debate is there, um, which is more to say that some of the questions about whether computers can be conscious or not are incredibly premature because we don't even know the nature of the question that we're asking. So I guess that's sort of my, my punchline at the end, but I'm hoping to convince you that um, there's still a lot of debate on this issue and uh, we don't really know exactly how to frame it. So, so Paul mentioned this problem of the hard problem of consciousness. Um, and he also um, somewhat alluded to this other problem that him and I identified, uh, which we called the hard problem of life. 
which comes from that very um, theorem from Kurt Gödel about systems referring to themselves. And you could ask, so for example, I can refer to myself or genes in some ways refer to um, the biological architecture they're embedded in and, and in some sense refer to themselves within cells, that this property of systems that can talk about themselves is actually a feature of life in general. And so some of the issues that Paul raised about Gödel's incompleteness theorem actually are paradoxes that are just found throughout biology, not just in reference to problems of consciousness. Um, and so we attempted to kind of relate this issue of the hard problem of life, this idea that systems can re reference themselves by information about themselves to this idea that there's this hard problem of consciousness about how that looks from the inside, what it feels like to have that subjective experience. Um, now, one of the questions we wanna ask is when is a physical system alive or when is it conscious? Um, and this question usually is asked in terms of asking about the materials that are conscious. Um, so it, Paul also talked about this, but there's this idea of neural correlates of consciousness. So um, instead of being able to actually go in and um, talk about measuring consciousness in a system because we don't have a theory to do that. Usually what we do is we have some fMRI data of activity in the brain when it's when someone's awake or asleep and we can associate that with their verbal report of being conscious or not. Um, and then we use that to construct um, measurements of properties associated to consciousness. But it's not the same thing as measuring measuring that subjective experience itself. Um, in the case of life, um, oftentimes what we'll do in astrobiology is go and try to measure the presence or absence of molecules that are present in living systems, like an amino acid or something. But that's not the same thing as finding a living system. So there's sort of this sort of issue with the fact that life and consciousness are associated with more abstract properties, self-reference, information processing, and all of these other things that they're not necessarily features of the materials that those um, uh, properties are, in, are actually realized in. Um, and so uh, in the sort of origin of life field, we get these kind of cheeky comments about this, that maybe life is a non-existent phenomena um, because you can't measure it in molecules. And basically when you get down to the scale of molecules, it disappears. Um, and so there's this other um, quote um, from a prominent origin of life scientist that if you focus experimentally on any of the defining properties of life, the sharp boundary seems to blur. And certainly if you look at an individual neuron in our brain, it's also not clear if it would be conscious even though our entire neural architecture is conscious. Um, but we also don't have these kind of radical statements, or at least most of us don't, that consciousness doesn't exist, although some people have certainly made the argument that it's not a real phenomena. Um, but it certainly feels like something to be us, so, so some explanation is needed. Um, there are theories out there that propose to explain what consciousness is. Uh, the leading theory of consciousness right now is something called integrated information theory, um, which purports to measure the level of conscious experience that we have with a measure called phi. Phi basically is calculated as the amount of information processed essentially in your brain as a collective system. So it's um, meant to capture this idea that the kind of information associated with consciousness is an emergent information and you need to calculate how much this, the parts of a system when they come together are more than just the parts would be individually. So it's sort of going contrary to that idea that, that maybe neural correlates are necessary, that we should be looking at the component parts, but that we actually have to look at how they're all wired together. And then somehow this property emerges and we can have this mathematical measure that purports to give us a value of how much consciousness we have. Um, and so the, the sort of way that it's phrased is how much is the sum greater than the parts? That's actually how much experience you're having. So when Paul was talking about the green, uh, your screen sharing and the red stop share that I'm now experiencing, but wasn't when he was talking about it, um, the idea there is that's a part of the integration of my brain. It's part of my integrated experience right now. It was not part of my experience when Paul was talking about that. Um, so this kind of idea that life and consciousness do not exist because we can't measure them in the neural correlates or the chemical correlates um, is really kind of an interesting feature of these two phenomena 
um, that we don't understand either of them. And part of the problem is they're not really properties of the physical materials themselves, right? So the integrated information measure I just um, uh, explained briefly is meant to get at this idea that it's somehow the way the parts are connected, but it's not the parts themselves and it's not a physical property of any of the individual parts. It's this emergent property of the system. So in some ways we can think about these things um, that they're really features of the software re of reality. They're not features of the hardware. So in some sense, people often talk about consciousness itself as being a simulation. It's an abstract property that's running on the hardware of our brains. And what we're experiencing is a sim simulation in our chemical hardware. This is not to say that reality itself is a simulation. Um, you could still make the argument that it needs a physical hardware to run on. But the idea being that the properties we associate to life and consciousness have to do with information flows and what's happening in that regard. And so they're more abstract properties. Now this introduces the idea you might be able to copy consciousness from one physical system to another. Um, and certainly in some ways we do that when we teach our kids how to behave like us, but whether or not they get that felt quality of experience from those interactions is another question entirely. So learning behavior is different than learning consciousness. Um, and so um, there's a lot of open questions associated with, uh, you know, whether this view is actually, you know, the right one. Um, one of the interesting features of it is exactly this, this idea that if you have a computation, so some abstract um, informational processing system, you can have it work in different hardware. So for example, Microsoft Word <laughs> works on a Windows computer and a Mac OS. Right, um, and um, it doesn't really matter about the hardware. Uh, simil similarly, um, I'm speaking in language right now, which is a kind of information. It was, you know, it's I thought about it in sort of the wet chemistry of my brain, but I could also type the words on my computer. So um, when we're talking about computations and these abstract properties, we know that they can exist in, in different physical systems, and that we can do the same computation in, in different media. So this maybe suggests the idea that consciousness could exist in computers. But it depends on whether or not this as sort of a property of computation is actually um, allowing us to um, build constructive theories of consciousness or if this is actually sort of breaking our current theories. Um, and so um, one way of actually looking at this idea that the same computation can be in different systems is exactly what Paul was talking about with this notion of a Turing test. So if I'm sitting here talking to you and I have a robot next to me uh, talking to you and saying the same words um, and you interact with us, you would not know that I was conscious and the robot wasn't because the input output of the words that we're saying are effectively the same. And so that's the idea that the computation is the same, but my wet brain chemistry or the circuits in the robot would be different. And so that's the physical implementation. Um, and so the idea um, that a lot of people have proposed as being sort of um, uh, challenging um, some theories of consciousness is that this introduces the idea of philosophical zombies that your theory of consciousness might not be able to tell the difference between me as a conscious agent um, and the robot sitting next to me um, if our behavior from the outward side was identical under all circumstances. Um, and again, this is the idea that, that the input output behavior is the computation and it can exist in a conscious system and an unconscious system. And for all intents and purposes, when you observed it from the outside, you would think it was the same thing. Um, and so this slide's a little bit technical, so you don't have to read the details, um, but basically what's happened with integrated information theory and uh, other related leading theories of consciousness is that looking at this fact that the input output map can be um, present in different systems with different physical implementation, so a wet brain or a circuit in a robot, um, leads to the idea that that integrated information itself is actually already a falsified theory because um, in the example that I was showing here, um, the unconscious circuit might have a zero phi, so no integration, um, and the conscious circuit has some integration, um, but they have the same behavior. So you wouldn't be able to tell from the outside any difference. Um, and so there's some formal arguments about why that falsifies the theory of consciousness. Um, and I wanted to just um, kind of give a shout out to Jake Hansen because he just defended his thesis today, um, who's one of our PhD students in the Beyond Center doing this kind of work. And this is a very complicated slide, but the main thing to take home is there's a 
physical implementation, which is shown all the way on the right, and there's many possible physical implementations for the same computation that can be shown on the left. And once you have this kind of structure where these computations can be manifest in different kinds of systems, you either have to say that consciousness is the computation itself, or you have a theory that's unfalsifiable because it's specific to the physical architecture that it's in. So there's specific details that you can't actually test um, in different scenarios. Um, and so this leads to some big problems uh, with theories of consciousness that all of current theories, um, there's some debate in the field now are either already falsified um, because they're trying to measure differences at the level of the computation that aren't possible to measure the differences or they're unfalsifiable because they're so embedded in the physical implementation that there's no way of actually falsifying the theory. Um, and, um, and so a lot of this sort of idea about the falsification comes from um, two um, emerging leaders in this theory area of mathematical theories of consciousness, Johannes Kleiner and Eric Hole, and their argument basically claiming that all current theories of falsification are of consciousness are already falsified or unfalsifiable leads to the suggestion that the presence or absence of a particular experience itself has to make a difference to the system. Otherwise, you won't be able to test it as a scientific theory. Um, and so this idea has been discussed for a long time, but it leads to its own problems because it means that consciousness has to be able to intervene to actually change physical properties of the materials that it exists in, um, in a way that we would be able to measure that would be different than just this idea that it's a computation that can actually be moved from one physical system to another um, and is, you know, kind of di dissociated from it. So it actually has to be a physically embedded theory in order for, for it to be falsifiable and scientifically testable. Um, so I want to just finish, wrap up in, in my last minute here um, with a, a question from Dan Dennett, which is if you know we're so interested in the hard problem of subjective experience, the real question we should be asking is, and then what happens? Um, and so this is sort of uh, Dan Dennett's cheeky retort to David Chalmers that um, Paul was talking about earlier. Um, and um, part of what he's saying is we should not be asking the hard problem of consciousness. We should be asking the hard question. Um, and the hard question is, and then what happens? In terms of once some item or content enters consciousness, what does this cause or enable or modify? So what would be the observational consequences of something that had subjective experience? Um, from the perspective I was showing before, if you're just looking at these behavioral states and things, the behavior is the only thing you can observe. Therefore, consciousness has to be behavior. And there are longstanding tradition of behaviorist theories that people uh, variously like and dislike, and there's a lot of debate about that. Um, and integrated information theory came in as this sort of rising star against behaviorist theories, but might, might actually demonstrate that, that such theories aren't possible um, unless we come up with new ideas about that and then what happens. Um, and so the question I have about consciousness, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about since um, Jake Hansen has been doing his work in our group, um, which is, are there things that can happen only if a physical system has experiences? Um, and are there features of consciousness we can only measure across space and time or at the level of collectives rather than individuals? So what do I mean by this? Well, most of us are thinking about consciousness inside our brains because we care about our own subjective experience. But subjective experience itself might not be accessible to science, um, but there might be effects at the collective level of groups of humans or um, individual humans where subjective experience actually starts to matter and have physical consequences that we can measure. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll just give an example, um, which is that we had imagined in our minds, so it was part of our representation of the world and our experience, our qualia, uh, rockets um, and flying machines for hundreds of years before we built them. So clearly the fact at least that our minds can represent abstractions and do information processing does have consequences in the world. Um, whether or not that's actually a feature that you can uniquely pin to subjective experience, what it feels like um, to experience the world is another question. And so I'll just leave on that. Um, and thank you all, I'm looking forward to questions and discussion. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Paul. Uh, we can now take some questions. If you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A. Uh, and uh, I'll start with a question from uh, Richard Hart, who asks, is there any reason to assume that the so-called neural correlates of consciousness 
would actually reproduce in any consistent way our subjective experience of conscious sensation. So who wants to take that? Paul, I think you were muted, but it looked like you were talking, so go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, well, th this is where we hit the difference between the easy problem and the hard problem. Uh, and so, uh, right, so you could um, mimic all the neurocorrelates, and then the entity might be a computer, might be a robot, might be something we can't even imagine yet, would respond in an appropriate fashion. So if, you, if it was behind a screen or something, uh, you would conclude that this entity was conscious. But uh, we're back to the problem that uh, it's not, uh, uh, doesn't solve the problem of qualia, the hard problem. Uh, you have no idea whether you're dealing with um, a zombie who is uh, behaving just like a human being but has no inner life, no inner experience. Uh, and I don't see how we can ever really get at that, to be honest. I'm, I don't think we can ever solve the hard problem uh, of uh, using science or using any other method because subjectivity is by definition it's something that's inside me and only I can have my subjective experiences and the rest uh, is uh, an inference and and if this seems a bit mysterious this whole zombie business let me just give an example uh, that I found from Daniel Dennett's book uh, Consciousness Explained that I think is uh, very illuminating there are uh, some stroke victims who lose uh, part of their visual field. Uh, they are technically blind, uh, maybe one half of their visual field. Um, and if you present information, uh, because you know the right eye goes to the left side of the brain, and all that, if you pre present information to the blind side of this individual's uh, brain, uh, and it might be something like pick up the hammer, and there's a hammer on the table in front of them, and they and join up, they pick up the hammer. And when you say, why did you do that? They, they don't know, they give some sort of crazy story. Uh, in other words, the uh, individual uh, is responding appropriately to the external stimuli without having any conscious awareness. They're not, they don't see the sign, they don't interpret it, they just do the right thing. And if you imagine having blind sight across your whole busy field, and then driving a car, and you stop at the red traffic light. Why did you do it? Well, you know, you maybe come up with some story. Um, but if you can behave appropriately, I'm just this is a sort of silly example, but if you can behave appropriately without having the qualia, the subjective sensation, then it makes you think, well, why do we need this thing called uh, consciousness? Why do we need the subjective experience at all? And I could well imagine that I'm surrounded by a world full of zombies. And I even, years ago, when I thought about this, thought, is it a reductio ad absurdum, imagining a university philosophy department entirely staffed by zombies sitting around arguing about theories of consciousness. <laughs> but uh, I think from the outside, there's no way that I could tell or anybody else. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> All right, uh, next question is, um, this one was emailed by Ruben Ortiz, and I think I'll hand this over to Sarah. And the question is, uh, what current benchmarks does the scientific community use as a standard when measuring levels of consciousness? So can you talk about different levels of consciousness? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there aren't uh, standard benchmarks. I mean, there's different measurements that people can take, but sort of the you know, the golden theory right now is the integrated information theory that I mentioned. And part of the reason that people like that so much is that it gives a mathematical measure. And that measure, um, you know, has a, a set of values associated with it. So you can talk about some systems being more conscious than others. Um, and that is about as close as you get, but there's some issues with that, that you can't actually measure it for systems that have more than about 10 component parts. So people have come up with, because it's computationally very intensive to chop up these systems and measure their integration. Um, so um, people have come up with a lot of approximations and then they talk about um, the level of integration of uh, brains um, performing certain functions. Um, other than that, most of it's sort of a proxy and you don't have a, a quantifiable metric associated to it, which is one of the reasons that people would like a mathematical theory of consciousness, because they'd like to be able to say, this pa patient is no longer conscious, this patient is very conscious, 
Um, and you know, maybe the outward experience, outward appearances don't tell you that difference, but there's other features that might. Okay, thank you. Um, and here's another question. I think maybe this is also for Sarah. This is sort of what you talked about. Uh, is ontological reflection or awareness one of the hallmarks of consciousness? Um, so is how much is self-reflection? Or... Um, I, I mean, I think most of the debate on um, conscious experience our consciousness is about the hard problem. So it's more the problem of experience than self-awareness. Um, and in some ways you could imagine systems to have uh, self-awareness without having a felt quality of experience and vice versa. So those quality, those two properties are, are kind of, uh, can be disentangled. So you can have an experience without being aware of yourself um, and you can be aware of yourself maybe without having an experience. Um, uh, and so they're not the same feature at all. I don't know, Paul, if you want to elaborate on that a little bit more. No, I think we have to distinguish between consciousness and self-consciousness. And I guess what everyone's interested in here is not only do I experience things, but I know I experience myself and I know I'm experiencing things. Uh, and so you might think, well, a bacterium is in a rudimentary sense conscious because it senses its environment and re responds accordingly. But I don't think it's got an inner life. I don't think it would reflect on deep philosophical issues. Of course, we can't know. Uh, that's part of the problem with this whole area. And then people argue, well, what about my dog? You know, it seems to have an inner life, seems to know what it's doing. Uh, sometimes it's miserable, sometimes it's happy. Uh, it must have a sense uh, of its own self. And this is, of course, a famous slippery slope, uh, where from bacteria to dogs, does this thing called uh, consciousness or self-consciousness spring into being? And if you go back through the evolutionary history of the hominins, uh, what point, you know, 10 million years ago, 5 million years ago, is something that, that just like a phase transition, suddenly there was a, an individual that became self-aware, a bit like in Stanley Kubrick's 2001, A Space Odyssey. You know, was that what happened or was it a seamless transition? These are really tough questions. And I think people have been asking them for at least two and a half thousand years. And I'm not sure we're really making very much progress. Uh, so st sticking with the theme of self-consciousness for a moment, uh, here's a delightful question from Gabriel Ramos Fernandez who asks, uh, what's your opinion of empirical tests of self-recognition in animals, such as the mirror test? Can there be analogous tests for computers? So. Uh, something like the mirror test for computers. Great question. Uh, Paul, maybe? Extraordinary coincidence, because I was only thinking about this about four hours ago, and it's a completely different context uh, about uh, chimpanzees looking in mirrors, and, uh, and also thinking, uh, associating this with what we're doing now with Zoom, because of course, uh, we don't see uh, the mirror image, we see, we see the actual image, it's all very confusing. I think that's right. <laughs> Um, but right. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, pe some people have tried to, I mean, psychologists certainly have argued that uh, being able to recognize yourself in a mirror is part of uh, what consciousness is about. Um, some people have said, well, it's empathy with other individuals, or even things called mirror neurons, which light up uh, when you see, you know, if another person is suffering, then you sort of share in that. Um, uh, it, I think it's really very hard to, to know. I don't think I have anything profound to say about it. Okay, uh, changing gears uh, somewhat. Um, here's um, a question for Sarah, I think. Um, do you think it's possible that planet Earth could ever become self-aware on some level if enough conscious units became interconnected and exchanging information in a worldwide neural network like we're forming with the internet? Yeah, so, so again, I think you have to separate self-aware from consciousness. Um, but I, I have been working on a paper actually with a few colleagues on this idea of planetary intelligence, which we had a workshop in a symposium in the Beyond Center um, a few years ago, that you might think of cognition and intelligence, we think of them as collective properties already. So for example, people are willing to accept that 
ant colonies behave collectively and intelligibly, or even, you know, our brains are the collective properties of neurons interacting together. So it's, it seems reasonable to extrapolate that planetary scale phenomena may also exhibit intelligence, particularly as we transition to more integrated systems with our technology um, that we um, might have globally integrated artificial intelligence systems that are actually regulating, say, for example, planetary climate. And that would actually be um, a kind of global intelligence that's that's self-regulating planetary states. And so there's, there's some arguments um, actually made by David Grinspoon that in order to survive the current epoch of the Anthropocene with human-induced climate change and other features that we actually have to make this transition to planetary intelligence because right now we're exhibiting planetary stupidity because um, we aren't doing things to mitigate our existential risks on a global scale. Um, and so, so it, I think it is a real possibility. Those ideas go um, pretty far back. Um, I think Verdansk, Verdansky, I'm not going to pronounce this right, is um, that introduced the notion of the biosphere, also introduced this notion of the newosphere, which was sort of like the collective thought of all of the organisms on Earth as being kind Pearl of. Pearl Jardin, the Jesuit uh, priest. Ah. Pro probable perpetrator of the Piltdown Man hoax. Yeah. <laughs> Oh dear. Uh, a colorful character. He was excommunicated from oh, uh, Jersey. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's a long history of people thinking about those sorts of things. Um, and they're probably one of the crazier workshops we've had, actually, the planetary intelligence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Which think um yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a little out there, but I think it's within the realm of speculative thought that's reasonable. But yeah. Pretty out there. Okay. Here's another question that's been out there. Uh, two of the most intract intractable problems in science have been the issue of consciousness and the nature of time. Um, are there, is there any chance that those could be interrelated, Paul? Oh, uh, yes, yes. And I wrote a whole section of my last book on this. And so don't get me started though, because it could be a rather long answer. I just want to say uh, very briefly, because I think we, we had a, a session uh, uh, one of these astrophysicists on the uh, on time asymmetry, and I always distinguish the subjective impression of the flow of time. So we're back to the sort of good hard problem, easy problem. Subjective impression that time is flowing from the uh, incontrovertible fact that the future is different from the past. That states uh, can be ordered in a temporal sequence, uh, quite objectively, irrespective of how we uh, feel about it. And I think the flow of time comes because uh, our, uh, I don't think time is flowing. I, time doesn't change. Time doesn't pass. What changes is us, our mental states. Uh, that we, we think, well, I'm the same person as I was. I remember my childhood. Uh, it's me. Uh, the, the notion of selfhood is a sort of unitary, discrete thing. And I don't think that's true. I think we, I'm a different person today from yesterday. Not very different. Uh, technically, I would say the mutual information is very high between yesterday's me and today's me, but nevertheless, it, it changes. And what we're sensing is ourselves changing, not time. Time is just time. Uh, it's stretched out. It's not moving. It's not changing. Nothing is uh, kinetic about time. It's our mental states. Uh, it's our, our sense of self. And if you're stuck with the idea of thinking that you're, you are a fixed self, then you will think time is flowing. But once you get away from that, time isn't flowing, it's you. And it is somehow flowing or changing. Thank you, Paul. Um, here's a question about philosophical zombies or P-zombies. Uh, so similarly to people who have not consumed some um, psychoactive drug, cannot coherently talk about what it's like to experience the drug, could P-zombies coherently talk about what it's like to be conscious? Sarah? <laughs> well, I think that's the whole premise of the argument is that they could, so they're indistinguishable because they would report having an experience of consciousness that they're not having. So for example, I could be telling, I mean, I might be a pea zombie for all intents and purposes, but you, you wouldn't know. Um, and I could describe all of the qualities of my experience and mimic all of that. But but the, the, the reason they're a, a philosophical challenge is because they can do all those things. And you wouldn't be able to tell from the outside and without a firmer foundation of what consciousness is, whether they were lying or not. 
Okay, um, this is a very different kind of question. Uh, it's about um, our relationship with other conscious creations. Um, would computers be out to kill, assimilate, or replace us like in the films? Would they continue to serve us? Would we live peacefully together as equals? And a uh, similar question came in, uh, I think by email, about um, the ethics of other sentient beings. Uh, yes, well, um, if you read Isaac Asimov and his uh, three laws of robotics, <laughs> then uh, you could believe that um, computers or robots uh, would uh, would work with us and not against us. But I think we all know, uh, I think the point I'd like to make is that we might be able to design uh, artificial intelligence, artificial consciousness, or autonomous sentient uh, beings that would satisfy the Turing test. And it, but it wouldn't stop there because they would immediately set about designing their own next generation super duper uh, robots and they would go on to design the next generation, next generation. Now we can try to embed uh, an ethical code uh, right at the outset uh, into the architecture of these entities. But we know from Darwinian evolution that uh, nothing is forever. And it's very hard to see how something could be, uh, could uh, evade being circumvented further down the track, the end generation of these things. Uh, so when we embark on this uh, journey, we do so somewhat at our peril because I don't think the destination is uh, terribly clear. I think it's open-ended and it could evolve uh, in any sort of direction. The, there's a slight argument against it, which is the uh, so-called Fermi paradox. But if we imagine that we're not alone in the universe and there are advanced civilizations out there that will have gone down this path, um, then uh, they're uh, conscious computer progeny uh, might have um, escaped the confines of their planets, uh, been left let loose uh, and spread across the universe. And there are science fiction stories of this sort, uh, berserkers and other um, you know, entities that sort of rampage across the galaxy and destroy everything in their path. We haven't been the recipient of any sort of uncontrolled um, uh, male malevolent uh, machine intelligence or machine, machine uh, consciousness. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not there, it doesn't mean we couldn't do it in the future. I think uh, as a philosophical problem, ethical problem, how to ensure in perpetuity that our values are enshrined in whatever we might create is a very, very tough problem. Okay, um, here's a question for Sarah. How do dream states differ from conscious states? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not an expert in how people think about dreams and consciousness, but I guess um, is the question more, well, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer this one. I think the one thing I think is really interesting. So, so Eric Hole that I mentioned in my talk has this really interesting theory about why we dream. Um, related to overfitting um, like so so there's this issue in sort of uh, neural networks that like sometimes you can overfit your data and then you 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 actually don't have flexibility to predict predict things that are happening in your environment because your system's too rigid um, and so part of the hypothesis there is that dreams are actually a way of dealing with overfitting in the neural networks that are our brains um, and so that's not exactly answering how it's related to the conscious experience, but I think that that the idea that dreams serve a function related to our consciousness and our experience of the world is probably um, in the right ballpark. And I thought that that hypothesis of his was deeply intriguing. Um, Paul, do you have more to say on this? Well, only it's interesting that Giulio Tononi, the founder of integration yeah, information so theory, is uh, uh, really a sleep psychologist and an expert on dreams. I think uh, when you're dreaming, you're certainly conscious, but it's just that the world that you're dreaming about is not the real one. It's something conjured up in, in your brain. And uh, I don't know if any of our uh, listeners or our viewers uh, experience what is called lucid dreaming. It's quite different from just having a vivid dream. Uh, lucid dreaming is where you actually are aware of the fact you're dreaming. So you have the self-awareness uh, and the awareness that the world you're seeing is not the real thing, though sometimes it's hard to distinguish because it is so realistic. And um, uh, I've 
began experiencing lucid dreams in my teens and I was absolutely terrified uh, because I thought this was some sort of sleep paralysis or something terrible until um, I realized it was a, actually a well-known phenomenon. And it's an interesting thing because the, I mean, in normal dream states, everything's so wishy-washy uh, that if you say, well, there are only sort of laws of physics in my dream world, um, it, it all get, goes out the window. But with lucid dreams, you think, well, everything is just like sort of reality. Uh, and I took the trouble once, uh, we're just talking about this, um, uh, that if I look in, the, in a mirror in my lucid dreams, do I see the mirror image or, <laughs> or is it uh, the other way around? And, uh, and I actually did, did that experiment. Um, I don't have lucid dreams very often, but next time I am determined to do the Galileo experiment, you know, dropping two objects in if they hit the ground together. So I'd like to know do the laws of physics in this lucid dream world. Uh, mirror those of the real world. Yeah, just one, one more thing to add to that. I mean, people always ask about consciousness when we're like, like when we're dreaming, but it's also a feature that when we're conscious, it's it's effectively like dreaming because our mind is building building stories of the world around us. So, um, so I I think they're they're deeply related in that way. So um, I have some idea that you know the things I'm experiencing right now actually correspond to the real physical world, as Paul was saying. Um, but that may or may not actually be the case. And so there, there is a, another prominent um, researcher. I, I don't really subscribe to these theories. I think they're a little too uh, detached from reality. Um, but Don Hoffman has made some arguments that our conscious experience doesn't reflect physical reality at all. And it really is just a dream all the time. Um, and of course, you, you, could, you could see some validity to those arguments because you, you know I'm not directly interacting with the Zoom screen. What I'm doing is building a representation of it in my mind. Um, and so, um, so there is a dream going on in my head right now in the sense that my, my, the information in my mind is being constructed from the inputs that I'm getting. The question is how accurate are they reflecting the output, the things that are actually really out there or not. And in a dream, we have some association that they're not reflecting what's actually out there. Um, but we don't even know for our regular conscious daytime states how, how much they're reflective of what's really out there. I had a lucid dream uh, two days ago where I entered this uh, world and it was very exciting because I knew I was dreaming. And the sensation <laughs> of that was very similar to uh, when you put on this virtual reality headset. Yeah, I was gonna say, that's how I feel when I do virtual reality. <laughs> but you, but you didn't think to test the laws of physics in your lucid dream. Next yeah, time. I didn't think of doing that, <laughs> uh, marveling at the sensation. Um, here's a question. Uh, computers now crush, crush human players of chess and go and are making increasing inroads in areas like medical diagnosis. But the creation of literature, art, et cetera, still all seem exclusively human pursuits. Aha, we don't know for how long. Is this an argument against silicon-based consciousness? Paul? Yes, I, um, uh, well, it's part of it. I think um, what we call uh, computers these days uh, are extremely good and extremely fast at a very limited range of things. And I, um, I think conscious, certainly uh, full-blooded human consciousness, uh, if we may express it that way, is associated with a whole range of qualities. And we'd be talking about being aware of oneself and so on, um, having empathy and all of these things, I think, go to make up the full richness of what is human consciousness. Uh, and, I, um, and I think uh, writing poetry or music or something like that is, is part of it. I think uh, you, you can program a computer to mimic the creativity of human beings, but what you would really convince me that I was dealing with a truly conscious system is if it created something totally new that had not uh, arisen in human culture, a new cultural experience, uh, didn't just get it from, from human beings and do it better. It just came up with something genuinely new. I don't know what it might be because by definition it's new. Well, I think we're almost out of time. So I'll uh, ask, um, leave it with this one last um, question which you can interpret however you like. And it is, how much of I am I? <laughs> <laughs> which I think is an appropriate way to end here. So, uh, where take all right. All, all I want to say is that uh, personal identity is not something that can be isolated from the world that we experience.
Okay. Also, identity is not the same as consciousness. So you can actually uh, feel conscious, but be dissociated from your personal identity, like I was saying before, and there are well-known cases of that. Right. Uh, okay, uh, Jessica, would you like to make some announcements uh, about uh, next uh, the lecture next time? Um, just to what I said at the beginning, that it is on April 26th at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and registration links will be available in the next couple of weeks. And don't forget to watch all of our videos on the YouTube and submit your questions in advance, ideally, but you can also submit them using the Q&A during the Zoom. And that's it. Okay, thank you all. Uh, thank you to the panelists and thank you to the audience. Goodbye. Okay, goodbye everybody. Bye.